over here. Bill Nye, speaking to you from Los Angeles. No, it's, it's not really Los Angeles. Los Angeles isn't covered with miles of ice and snow. At least not now. It was 800 million years ago. But those glaciers have receded. And now Los Angeles is covered with smog and development deals. And the Earth's ice is mostly at the poles, at least for right now. The ice at the poles is melting. Arctic ice melted to a record low in 2002. In Antarctica, ice sheets the size of small states are falling into the sea. The reason? Well, their world, our world, the world, is getting warmer. I mean, is the rise in global temperature a result of the Industrial Revolution, burning fossil fuels and driving everywhere? Or is the rise in temperature just part of the natural ebb and flow of global temperature, and we just happen to find ourselves in the toasty, melty part? Should or even can we do anything about it? Well, yeah, that's the way I see it. the difficult question, is the current rise in global temperature natural or human-made, we have to look back, back in time. And of course, the details of time travel haven't been figured out yet, so we'll work with what we have. You know, after a few of these, I've seen people lose track of time altogether. <laughs> but it's not the juniper-flavored ethanol that we seek. No, no. It's the ice. Now, people say, how do scientists know how cold or warm the world was over the last hundred or thousand years? Well, there's a way to find out, and we're here at the National Ice Core Laboratory with Dr. Todd Hinckley. are going to show us how we know. We think we have the information here. We have 15,000 meters of ice, Bill, and we think that our collection here is cool in at least a couple of ways. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, real cool. So, uh, what are we looking at? Here in this aisle, Bill, you can think of yourself as standing in the middle of the Greenland ice sheet which is about two miles deep from snowtop surface to bedrock. It's been described by one scientist as a two-mile time machine because there's so much information in the individual layers of ice about what the Earth's atmosphere used to be like and about how hot or cold it used to be on the Earth at the time an individual snow layer fell. This ice has preserved a record of the conditions in the Earth's atmosphere on a yearly basis, because in Greenland, the annual layers of snow never melt. It's like uh, rings on a tree. It is something like rings in a tree, but our record goes back so much farther than the rings on any tree. Not 100 years, not, not, not 1,000 years, 400,000 years. In Antarctica, the deepest ice is 400,000 years old. And here, but here in Greenland, only? Only 250 here in Greenland. 1,000 years, tube after tube. See, it's cold in there. And here, you know, it's, it's a balmy minus seven. Dr. Fitzpatrick. Hey, Joe. Bill, come on in. I've got a 22,000-year-old ice core here for you to look at. This is a piece of ice from Greenland. This is from central Greenland, yeah. Now, what do we learn from this? Well, ice tells you by direct measurement what the composition of the atmosphere was at the time this snow became ice. So how does it do that? And, well, as the snow grains fall, they trap air in between them, and as they become buried with more and more and more snow... They seal the bubbles forever. Absolutely. If you have a bubble in 400,000-year-old ice, you've got a bubble that has 400,000-year-old air in it. You can see bubbles in here, but I have a better way for you to see bubbles on a piece of ice that I've actually cut in this direction out of this core, and I'm going to show it to you right next door. Well, let's, let's go next door. 
So what have we got here? So this is a paper-thin wafer of the ice from that core, and you can see the bubbles in it really, really clearly. Those there. white dots are bubbles. Yep. And what they have in them is a record of the concentration of all of the gases in the atmosphere at the time that snow became ice. So you can determine, for example, how much CO2, how much carbon Absolutely. dioxide was in the That's atmosphere. precisely how that kind of analysis is done, is to analyze the CO2 inside those bubbles. So not only then can you get the um, temperature, but you can also get the composites in the atmosphere all from these... All from the same piece of ice, piece of ice. and a lot more information as well. And you have a, an idea when the last ice age occurred and the one before that, mm -hmm. and, the one before that and you're pretty mm -hmm. sure that they're accurate, right? Oh, yeah. And so oh, yeah. you're also pretty sure the world's getting warmer. Oh, yeah. It's quite a thing to be in this bitterly cold laboratory and realize... It's getting warmer out there, It's getting there, warmer out there. <laughs> they say this is the world's tallest thermometer. It's in Baker, California. It goes up to 139 Fahrenheit, 59 Celsius. Now, times are a-changing. In 30 years, this thermometer may not be big enough. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Sanders, why should I worry about too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? You see, Mary and Tommy, in nature, carbon dioxide makes up just 0.03% of the atmosphere. Wow! Why would you say wow, Tommy, seeing as you have no reference to determine if that figure is extraordinary or not? Gee, Mr. Sanders, I sure had not thought of that. No, you sure had not, Tommy. Children, look at this chart. By the year 2000, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will have increased by about 30% since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Now, that may not seem like much to you and your punk friends, but it has a profound effect on plant and animal life. Gee, Mr. Sanders, what was that about our friends? Nothing, Mary. Now, let's watch another exciting segment of the Eyes of Nine Science Program. This is some of the information that we get from ice cores. Mm -hmm. So uh, the blue line is temperature. The blue line is temperature. It tells how much different the temperature has been, higher or lower, from the temperature today uh -huh. at this place in Antarctica where this ice core was drilled. And it goes over a period of 400,000 400, years. 400,000. So there it's warm. It's cool. Warm, cool, warm, 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 warm. We're in a warming period. We're in a warming period, and I might emphasize it's only in this little blue band here that civilizations and farming have developed. And this time ends at about 1850, before the Industrial Revolution. So here's temperature. Then what's the red one? The red one is carbon dioxide? The red line, labeled on the right, is the amount of carbon dioxide that's been present in the atmosphere at any time during this last 400,000 year period. Todd, Dr. Hinckley, a feller cannot help but notice that when the CO2 is high, the temperature is high. CO2 is low, the temperature is low. Moving together in lockstep, if you will. Uh, we're over here, and this one's still going up. We're already almost straight up today at 360 parts per million, which is much higher than it's been at any time in this last 400,000 years, and we think longer. So where is the temperature line going? We don't know. The physics would say that as we burn our fossil fuels and burn trees in our forests, that as the carbon dioxide increases, the temperature should at least eventually increase substantially. Mm -hmm. Huh. The sky's the limit, I guess. The whole global warming thing is all about hemp. Yeah. The oil companies, they got rid of hemp because it's like, no, we want to make this fake stuff out of oil. Yeah. Nylon and rayon and crayon. Yeah. And that stuff's fake and not as good as hemp. Right. right so let's just crank up the smokestack and make nylon, right? Right? And what do we get? Hotter, right? Right. So we're going to need hemp clothes because nylon doesn't breathe. The same thing that keeps the Earth warm enough for us to live here may make the Earth too warm for us to live here. I refer, of course, to the greenhouse effect. 
The effect is a result of having certain gases in our atmosphere, the greenhouse gases like methane, chlorofluorocarbons, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. They all trap heat. The energy in sunlight passes right through these gases on the way in, hits the Earth's surface, changes to heat, and then gets trapped by the greenhouse gases on its way back toward outer space. Now, over here in this box, we can add a little extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So turning this valve is like turning on your cars or your fossil fuel power plants, or it's like cutting down forests. Now there's a lot more CO2 in this tank than in this one. Now we have to wait a few minutes. Take a look at the temperatures. The temperature in the tank with extra CO2 in it is just a few degrees higher than the temperature in the box with just regular air. Now, a few degrees can be a big deal when you're a planet. heard about global chilling and how we're entering an ice age and how most of us will perish in freezing agony as we're slowly crushed in its icy tentacles of death. But perhaps it doesn't have to end that way. Here are a few things you can do to stop global chilling. To stop global chilling, we need to warm the atmosphere with high levels of gases like methane. To get more methane, instead of cleaning up our garbage, we could bury it in a big, stinky landfill. And we really need more carbon dioxide. I know trees are lovely, but if you cut them down and set them on fire, that releases a lot of gas. So start thinking of trees as the devil and burn them. But the best way an individual can release CO2 is with one of these, a car. So if anyone out there knows how to invent the car, now is the time to do it. And if you know how to invent an SUV, even better. Those are just a few of the things you can do to stop global chilling. Ah! Sorry, Thor. I, I thought you were a woolly mammoth. Oh, yeah, just, just pull it out. The Northwest Passage, a mythic trip from Europe to Asia across the top of the world. Sailors have sought this sea route for centuries, but they were unable to find it because of all the ice. So many died starving and freezing trying to find it. But soon, this navigator's holy grail may become a reality because the Arctic zone is warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. So the ice will melt and it will be possible to get from Europe to Asia without having to go through the Panama Canal. And that would be a savings of 8,000 kilometers. And for the super tankers that are too big to fit through the canal, they won't have to go around Cape Horn, a savings of 25,000 kilometers. So this could be great. We can get oil back and forth up here that much faster and burn it that much quicker and put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that much sooner. The Northwest Passage. Is this good news or just news? Welcome back to BBN News. A new report shows that the United States is largely responsible for global warming. The Yankee sods currently emit over 25% of the excess greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, as these thick-as-plank citizens average 6.6 .6 tons of greenhouse emissions per person every year. Because of the actions of these gormless former subjects, Glacier National Park could lose all of its glaciers by 2070. And, thanks to these grotty little mouth breathers, the cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C. now bloom seven days earlier than they did in 1970. And now, on to cricket, where the English national team once again lost to some idiots from France. France. Wow, that guy's pretty upset with us. 
But to understand why, we need to go back in time. Imagine life in the 1800s. If you wanted to run to the store, you had to hitch up the horses or walk. If you wanted a new dress, you had to sew it. If you wanted to bake a cake, stoke up the fire. A little butter for your bread? Well, milk the cow and churn the butter. A drink of water? Start pumping. Life was hard. Then came the steam engine, the prime mover of the Industrial Revolution. It was the first of many engines that converted heat into mechanical work. Steam engines pulled trains, ran textile mills, spun machine shops, and rolled iron and steel. We could do a lot with energy to burn. We built bigger bridges and faster trains, then automobiles. We could mass produce them, and people could drive anywhere, anytime, for anything. Life was good, but the price tag for all the success was pollution and carbon dioxide. You know what I'm talking about. You can see why the rest of the world might be upset with us. I mean, the U.S. has only 5% of the world's population, but we emit 25% of the world's CO2. In 1997, the U.N. got started on global warming by hammering out the Kyoto Protocol. This charter would require countries or regions to reduce their emissions by significant fractions by 2012. The European Union, Japan, and Russia are among the developed countries that have signed and ratified the treaty and are working hard to hold up their ends. The United States withdrew from the protocol and as of 2005 has rejected the treaty. Hmm. In the coming decades, say the next 100 years, the ocean's level is going to rise because the world is getting warmer. The ice at the North and South Poles will melt, but it's interesting to note that as ice at the Arctic melts, well, that water won't make the ocean's level go up because that ice is floating. It displaces as much water as it weighs. Ice is unique. As water freezes, its molecules slow down, and it doesn't sink. See, when it's a few degrees above freezing, its hydrogen bonds drive its molecules into what's called an open lattice crystal. The molecules spread out. Ice is less dense than liquid water, so it floats. That's why you don't see ice at the bottom of a lake, and icebergs float on the surface of the sea, where ships can run into them. But as ice in glaciers, say in Glacier National Park, and in big ice sheets, like in Antarctica melts, well, that water will flow into the sea and make the oceans come up. But a much bigger effect than melting ice is thermal expansion. Expansion of the ocean due to heat. Water is just like anything else. It's made of molecules, and the molecules are always moving. The warmer water is, the faster its molecules move. Faster molecules push each other apart, just like the liquid in a thermometer. Expanding liquid water is going to overrun a lot of icy drinks on warm beaches. You see, as the ocean gets warmer, it's going to expand as much as, say, 50 centimeters. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but 50 centimeters of ocean level rise translates into 50 meters of lost shoreline. If it goes up a meter, we lose 100 meters of shoreline. So that's like, bye-bye, bayous, Seychelles, sayonara. So long, Maldives. Bangladesh, you're going to take another one on the chin. Ciao, Venice. It's been said that the tide waits for no one, and that's true. But soon, the ocean may not wait for whole island nations full of people. And we'll no longer have to go down to the sea because the sea will be coming up to us. See, it's not just that the world is getting warmer. It's the rapid rate at which it's getting warmer. Many species are not going to have enough time to adapt. Only the versatile ones are going to survive, like, like cockroaches. Already we're seeing migrations of animals away from the equator toward the poles, where it's cooler. Africa, it's hot, and the desert is moving toward us. You know how we know? The springbok. They're animals that are moving south to get away from the heat. It's global climate change, my friends. It's happening everywhere. In the United States, Americans generate over six and a half tons of carbon per person, mostly by driving and making electricity. Now, if you choose an efficient car and conserve electricity, you can cut your own emissions down to almost one third of the national average. Now, that's what we each can do. 
But what should we all do globally? It's a big question. So joining us today is Dr. Jay Edmonds. Now, if I understand it, it sure looks to me like the amount of carbon in the world's atmosphere is just going up and up and up because we continue to burn fossil fuels, right? Now, we're not going to run out of fossil fuels. That's exactly right. It's one of the great myths that we're on the verge of running out of fossil fuels. And it's continued for a long period of time. That myth is, has tremendous uh, resilience. Now, it's not true. Now, why do you say that? Because the resources of fossil fuels are very abundant. Conventional oil and gas is relatively limited, but we've had tremendous ability to take what are called unconventional resources of oil and gas and through technology, move them from the unconventional category into the conventional. Still, you're going to end up with some chemical reaction that puts carbon in the atmosphere. Correct. Therein lies the issue. So what we need to do is find a way to charge people, to charge us, ourselves, for carbon, right? If carbon had a cost, then the people would have an economic incentive to do something about it. Eventually, if carbon takes on a value, people are going to shift away from freely putting carbon into the atmosphere. They'll go to the conservation. They'll go to the capture and disposal. They'll go to things like fuel cells. They'll go to something things like biotechnology, growing plants explicitly for their energy content, or possibly even taking the advances in the biological sciences and using biological mechanisms to take water and turn it into hydrogen and oxygen. What if we don't do this stuff? What if we don't change our policies? What's going to happen? Well, the prospect is that there's nothing that will limit the cumulative emission globally of carbon to the atmosphere. So you would say this is an important thing to be doing? This is very important. Those technologies need to be developed. They need to be brought from the drawing boards into reality or we need to know that you can't do that at the same time as we don't forget those things which got us to where we are today like the energy conservation like the solar like the wind like the nuclear power like the non-emitting technologies we already have in our portfolio that's great doctor thanks very much for coming by thank you i know what you're saying you're saying hey bill nine mr science guy the world's getting warmer so what i mean the CO2 is already in the air. The world is warming. Our goose is cooking. The horse is out of the barn. What's to be done about it? What could I possibly do about global warming? The strange thing about global climate change is that every single thing each and every one of us does affects everybody all over the world. Because you see, it's one global ecosystem. OK, there's no getting out, not for any of us. So I'll tell you what. Use less energy, drive less, maybe drive less inefficient cars, turn out the lights. You could, with every one of your decisions, dare I say it, change the world. I hope you'll think about it. And I'll see you next time on The Eyes of Nine. And the main thing is... Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Check out eyesofnigh.org for more cool science.